Uruguay, South America in the summer of 1930. Spectators and teams from all over the world arrive for an international event never held before, the first Football World Cup. 100,000 people fill Montevideo's new stadium. The huge crowds are part of a new phenomenon, mass sport. In the 20th century, sport becomes more than just a game. It becomes a business and a focus for national prestige as the excitement and passion it brings to people's lives is increasingly exploited. Sport was still at an innocent stage when the Olympics were held in London 20 years earlier in 1908. The leader in the marathon staggered in and collapsed just before the finish. But officials were kind enough to pick him up and help him across the line. Archery was one of the few events for women. There was no danger of body contact. Olympic sport was still a pastime for the gifted amateur. It didn't matter how many spectators were in the stands. But behind the amateur gentility, there were already signs of rougher times to come. In the tug of war, the Americans accused the English of cheating because their team wore spikes on their boots. 1908 was the first Olympics in which competitors entered as members of national teams rather than as individuals. Soon national rivalry, the urge to win and the professionalism that followed would transform sport. When the troops came home in 1918, the world was changing fast. In America, they returned to a civilian life where wages were higher. And with working hours reduced, people had more leisure. On the continent of Europe, the fastest growing professional sport was cycle racing, which took the thrills out to the people in the towns and villages. The Tour de France had been run since the turn of the century, and the number of riders increased as fast as the prize money. In France, le vélo was king, but people were watching more sport of all kinds. In Britain, tennis attracted a growing middle class. The popular press built up the players as personalities, though they were still amateurs. 20-year-old Suzanne Longlong was the first major tennis star. So many wanted to see her that all her games had to be played on the centre court. Longlong added a new ingredient to spectator sport in the 1920s, sex appeal. She cast off her corsets and changed the game's image forever. She eventually turned professional and made a fortune from her popularity. Full commercialism came most rapidly in boxing. In 1921, a fight in America showed just how much money could be made from the public's growing appetite. A barroom brawler from the American West, Jack Dempsey, the Manasseh Mauler, was set to fight a French war hero named Georges Carpentier. Tex Ricard, the promoter, found backers to put up the unheard of stake of half a million dollars for the World Heavyweight Championship. No existing stadium was big enough for the number of customers Ricard needed to make the fight pay. So he built his own in a New Jersey field 
to be used just once. The promoter used the press as no one had before. He drove journalists into a frenzy of publicity for the fight of the century. Special trains brought in the crowds. Among them was a local butcher and his 12-year-old shop assistant, Joe Liguori. He had promised me a couple of weeks before that uh, he was going to take me to the fight. And I was all excited about it, you know what I mean? I had never been, at, at that age, I've never been to a fight. All the promotion paid off. Admission prices ran up to $50, the highest ever charged. They expected a, a big crowd. And they got the crowd too. Boy, believe me, the whole stadium was just packed. People were saying, my God, if this thing ever collapses, you know, there'll be a catastrophe here. 90,000 people in a wooden stadium. You know, every time they got up to cheer, everything sort of shook a little bit, you know? In the end, the fight of the century was a great spectacle, but a short one. The fight only lasted as far as the fourth round, when Carpentier was counted out. The successful promotion of the Dempsey fight was mass sport in its newest form. It made hundreds of thousands of dollars and provided irresistible theatre for the public. At the centre of the stage was Dempsey, the hero who'd been seen to rise from nothing to fame and fortune. It was an American dream. In Britain, after the First War, the prospects for grand sporting spectaculars with high ticket prices weren't promising. People had less to spend on sport or anything else. Billy O'Donnell worked in Liverpool. Squalor, disease, bad days, vermin, cars, oh, terrible. How they can call them good days, I don't know. But for most working people, there was one bright spot in the week. Football. In 1900, there had been only a handful of professional teams. By the 1920s, there were more than 80. The game had become an essential part of many people's lives. Football was always football in Liverpool. Nothing else. We were looking forward to Saturday coming. A working man, if he, if he was working, would be uh, 12 o'clock. Knock off, half day Saturday, lunch. Maybe if he, if he had a couple of pub, meets his pals in the local. But well, either walk up or get the tram car. Get up there for quarter to three, maybe. Ready for the kickoff. Oh, I do like to see a game of football. And then in the afternoon, come round. Big blue rain. Away. Football was so important for everybody. When you went in this corner of the street or anything like that, if you couldn't talk about football, well, what 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 do you talk about? You know, that, that was the that was the idea. And we'd meet there every Saturday and uh, if anyone was missing, they'd say, yeah, it was so-and-so, you know, we didn't live near you. Just knew him as Jack or George. Where's George? He must be sick or something. You were, you were missed, you know. Well, that went on all over the cop. In 
In all weathers, they turned out to stand packed together on the terraces. The clubs took the supporters who paid at the gate for granted and spent little to make them comfortable. You couldn't get back for the toilet, see? Some of them would go in after a few pounds and they'd talk where they were. But we used to roll the newspaper up, you know, so, make a funnel so it wouldn't splash on anyone. But if you were at the bottom, Perth of Wellington, so, or nothing, you know, or you were, <laughs> you were walking ankle deep. <laughs> The sense of community which bound the supporters together was almost tribal. It united small towns with their own clubs and brought passionate divisions to big cities with rival teams. Sydney Garner supported West Ham United, one of 11 league clubs in London. This is my hat. This is my skull. The two West Ham colours. Where were they playing? Where were we went? This was our gear. And one of our songs we used to sing, it was the theme song of West Ham's, I'm forever blowing bubbles, went something like this. <clears throat> I am forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. They fly so high, nearly reach the sky. They're like my dreams, they fade and die. Fortune's always hiding. I've looked everywhere. I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. Honey, and it's still there. Hmm. In 1923, Sydney Garner's team got through to the Cup final to meet Bolton Wanderers in the new stadium being built at Wembley in northwest London. With football attendances rising rapidly, Wembley had been designed to hold 127,000. To prepare for these numbers, the engineers tested the terraces with sandbags. Then they called in regiments of workmen to reproduce the shocks and vibrations of a crowd in full cry. But the stadium still wasn't big enough. On the day of the cup final, 200,000 arrived at Wembley. Among the West Ham supporters hoping to get in was the 18-year-old Sidney Garner. When we was approaching Wembley, we made our way towards the main gates, and there was literally thousands and thousands of people. And then we heard them say they've closed the gates. And all of a sudden, there was a surge at the back. Fences went down. We were literally jumping over obstacles. We, a lot of people fell, got trampled on. Pal of mine nearly got choked. He had a tie on, and his tie got caught. See, you one of the turnstiles or somewhere, and as the crowd was pushing, he was choking, but his tie split, luckily. You know what I thought, isn't it? The scenes at Wembley were a chaotic demonstration of the fever mass sport could arouse. As the barricades fell, the crowd outside poured onto the pitch. Before play could begin, mounted police had to clear them to the touchlines. It was the clearest evidence so far of football's huge and growing popularity. You know, Khan hitting, hitting, trying to hit away from Dean. In the 1920s, millions more were attracted to sport as the wireless came into people's homes. 
To help listeners follow football over the air, the BBC divided the pitch into numbered squares, printed in the Radio Times. There it goes, snap in the middle of the goal. Seven. Ken's head is there, going away. Eight. Ball comes out of Britain. Britain manoeuvres, centres, goes right in. Back to fists out. Comes on to Marshall. Six. Marshall clears. Oh, dear, oh dear, Marshall. Taking a flying, last despairing... Whole new businesses latched onto the game and made money from it. They sold football books, special magazines, comics and games. And with most forms of gambling still restricted, there was another reason to follow the results. The pools. By far England's newest and most lucrative business is the gambling on the matches. Weekly, three million Britishers take six penny chances on their ability to pick the winners. As thousands of people find that with only enough money for a postage stamp in their pocket, they can still take a little flyer on credit, the industry grows by leaps and bounds. Even the government profits by an institution that it tried to discourage. As post office receipts boom under an unprecedented flood of money orders. Hundreds of tons of mail a day. In the United States, the game of baseball was promoted with growing efficiency. Special indicator boards relayed the excitement of the World Series annual high point of the national game across the country. Americans learned baseball from childhood. Bill Werber grew up with the game. Sandlot baseball. And that's why we played all summer long. It was not organized ball. It was not sponsored by anybody. We earned the money, bought our balls, bought our bats. Uh, our parents bought our gloves. So baseball was the game, and all of the kids had their own individual heroes, and, and uh, we felt ourselves very fortunate if upon occasion we were taken to see a game. I love the way these people uh, walked. I love the way they swung the bat. I uh, was thoroughly enamored of the grace and their movements and fielding and throwing the baseball. It was altogether a pretty good experience. Baseball had grown since the 1870s when the first professional teams had been formed. In the 1920s, the owners began adjusting the game to bring in still more spectators, including women. They were trying to get women interested in baseball, which they did. And I think the, the atmosphere at the ball game was very, very exciting. You had great times rooting. You could, you could say almost anything you wanted. Uh, you never heard anything said that was very vulgar. Uh, you might call an umpire a bum. Anna Freund and her sister grew up near Yankee Stadium in New York. We would go to ball games rather than the movies. And the way we were punished, my worst punishment was to say you cannot go to the ball game. One skill more than any other drew thousands of new spectators. Players who could make one great hit into the stands and then get round all three bases and back to the plate with a home run. And owners made sure it now happened more often by introducing a harder ball. One player built his reputation on his home runs and became a legend in the 1920s and 30s, Babe Ruth. Oh, Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth, he won't lose that ball and that's the truth. There is not a player in the land who can hit a ball like Babe Ruth can. If two men are on base, don't throw near the plate. For if you do, he'll knock it about a mile. And if the pitcher throws one across the plate, he's a home run guy with a smile. Ruth, here's your contract for $80,000 for two years. And you kindly sign your name. All right, Colonel. Ruth was the orphan who shook hands with the great and earned more than they did. He was the most popular hero in a new age of sporting heroes. 
Ruth was a glutton and a drinker, but his obvious flaws endeared him to his fans. When the Yankees signed Bill Werber as a young professional, he soon gained direct experience of the myth. I was in the shower one time and and uh, the warm water was coming down on my face and I was lathering my shoulders and arms and and stomach and one thing with the warm water and the soap and I felt a, a, a hot stream in the middle of my back and I wondered how the water in my back could be hotter than the water in my eye and I turned around and there was uh, Ruth used in the middle of my back as a urinal. And uh, I turned around and uh, he was enjoying himself, so there wasn't anything for me to do but to enjoy myself too. And I felt, well, I said, looks like I'm being accepted. In England's bat and ball game, the professionals earned far less and had a different style. The great Jack Hobbs was modest and shy about his fame. Playing for Surrey and England, Hobbs broke all cricket's records and was idolised. Certainly you knew Hobbs was batting. Off we all went. We might be playing cricket in the streets as we were in those days, with a wicket against the wall, but our game of cricket would go and we would all run up the over to watch Jack Hobbs bat. <laughs> he must have put a thousand people on the gate if he was batting. It used to be sixpence to go in after after the tea interval at the Oval and sit on the grass. We were really squashed. And of course, there were no terraces then. It was just uh, wooden benches with no backs. And uh, it was most uncomfortable, really. But we didn't notice that because we were so enthralled. On one occasion, when... Uh, Surrey were going off, we rushed out to pat him on the back and that was really something. When we went home and told our mum and dad that we patted the great Jack Hobbs on the back. The nearest most got to their guards was through collecting the cards given away with every packet of cigarettes, as the tobacco companies used the interest in sport to promote their own sales. By now, cricket was played throughout the British Empire in the Caribbean and in India. And it took firm root in Australia. In the regular series played against England for the Ashes, the Australians produced a succession of their own heroes. None had more impact than a brilliant young batsman from New South Wales. Who is it that all Australia raves about? Who has won our very highest praise? Now is it Amy Johnson or little Mickey Mouse? No, it's just a country lad who's bringing down the house. And he's our John Bradman. Now I ask you, is he any good? Our Don Bradman Every Aussie dipped his lid to you The Ashes assumed a new significance in 1932 when the English team introduced controversial tactics to try and deal with Bradman. They left for Australia with a plan. Jardine, the England captain, intended to exploit the high-speed bowling of one of his players, ex-coal miner Harold Larwood. When we get to Australia, we shan't forget the good wishes of those who've been kind enough to come and see us all. And we hope that they will do as they hope we will do, and return with the ashes. In a game that had prided itself on its gentility, Jardine took an uncompromising approach to victory. His methods brought a new division to popular sport. Saturday, the 15th of January, 1933, in the third test match between England and Australia, the record crowd of 50,962 cricket fans yelled, Blue Murder! The body line balloon exploded. 
MCC skipper Douglas Jardine brought his three big guns, Lawood, Allen and Boast, to bear on the Australian batsman. They dropped him short on the leg stump, Lawood hurtling the ball down at 90 miles an hour. What shocked people about Larwood's bowling was that he aimed at the batsman's body rather than the stumps. Bradman found it difficult, but that was just the start of it. It was hit or get hit, and Australia's captain, Billy Woodfull, got hit. In the stands was 18-year-old Cess Starr. Jardine was the uh, man they were blaming more than anybody else. The crowd started pelting him with uh, orange peel and anything of a nature, uh, anything that they could throw of that type. And it was so bad, got so bad, that he was only there for an over or two and he had to shift himself and go back to his original position. Another bumper from Lawood and the ball crashed into Oldfield's temple. The controversy went far beyond the cricket field. Politicians joined the row. Trade between England and Australia was threatened as sports sent national temperatures soaring. The air became, well, you could feel it, volatile, electric. It would only need one man, one person, I feel, to have jumped the fence and there could have been a very serious situation. The deadly enmity which had developed is best described by the cable sent to the MCC in London by the Australian Board of Control. It read, Bodyline bowling assumed such proportions as to menace best interests of the game. In our opinion, it is unsportsmanlike, and unless stopped at once is likely to upset friendly relations existing between Australia and England. It could have been the end of Test cricket, really. I mean, they still think it was uh, cheating. Well, it may have been cheating in a way, but... But then uh, there's always some ploy that uh, is used, I suppose, to win. As football spread round the world, it raised its own fervour and controversy. It was now played and watched in more countries than any other game. Around Europe, sports papers built huge circulations covering the game. In Italy's Gazzetta dello Sport, readers followed teams, many of which were owned by big companies. In France, they read about the two Paris teams, Racing and Stade Francais, Bordeaux and Marseille, and many more. Germany's Sports Weekly was called Der Kicker. The people's game had crossed national barriers. In the cities of South America, football was taken up with more zeal than anywhere else, feeding nationalist fervor. Uruguay had grown wealthy selling beef. When the British came to build the railways, they brought football too. The children of the English brought the first balls, boots and uniforms. It was a novelty. People called it the game of the crazy English because they wore shorts. It was very odd, shorts. The local kids watched them and started imitating the players. They began to think they could do better. Diego Lucero played as a boy and went on to become a professional. In his lifetime, football was taken up all over South America. Great rivalries built up, especially between Uruguay, a small country of only two million people, and its bigger neighbor across the river plate, Argentina. The 
The international matches between Argentina and Uruguay were great social gatherings. The ladies came all dressed up. The President of the Republic and ministers and so on. It was a real diplomatic event. Europeans knew little of Uruguay's prize until they surprised everyone by winning the gold medal at the Olympics twice in the 1920s. Increasingly, their national morale was tied to their success in football. It brought great honor to the country and great benefit. People across the world began to look at their maps to see where Uruguay was. Without a doubt, what the footballers did was a great thing for the country. The huge following for football in South America was confirmed when Uruguay's bid to hold the first ever World Cup in 1930 was accepted. The Uruguayans rushed up a brand new stadium. England, founders of the modern game, haughtily boycotted the cup, but 13 national teams arrived. And what mattered most in Montevideo were local rivalries. Only months before the championship, Argentina had beaten Uruguay and proclaimed themselves world champions. Ondino Vieira, a Uruguayan coach, remembers the outrage caused by this presumption. It was a declaration of war. The championship developed into a psychological war between Uruguay and Argentina. It led to the breakdown of diplomatic relations between the two countries. The climax came in the final, when the two South American neighbors faced each other for the world championship, not merely as teams, but as countries. All around the stadium was a multitude of people who couldn't get in. There were lots of police. It was a climate of virtual war, a football war. It was a terrible thing, a struggle, hard. The match was a battle. At half time, we were losing 2 1. The Argentinians thought they'd won the World Cup. In the second half, Uruguay came back and scored three goals. The first World Cup was theirs. The enthusiasm seized everyone. Men, women and children poured out of the stadium onto the streets. The whole night long they celebrated the championship. Uruguayan pride and national feeling was boosted for generations to come. It was therefore no wonder that other governments began systematic attempts to work the same sporting magic for themselves.